Did you starve up at home? Uh, next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I'm sitting here with Mr. Michael Lundin, Senior Prestige Brand Ambassador at Diageo. And maybe you don't know Diageo by name, but you most certainly do know some of their brands in the portfolio, such as Guinness, Smyrna of Tangeri, Johnny Walker, etc. But Michael, that's not the stuff you are working with. Tell us a little bit about what you are doing and what you're working with. Tim, uh, happy to be here, firstly. Um, so, long title, Senior Prestige Brand Ambassador, yeah. <laughs> we love titles in Diageo. No, uh, kidding. But uh, uh, my daily work is, and has been for many, many years, I'm, I'm traveling constantly, I do presentations, I'm teaching, uh, conducting masterclasses, which is most likely most of my time, what I'm doing. So masterclasses in, in consumer affairs, consumer activities. So my target, my aim is to reach as many private consumers as possible. And uh, as a brand ambassador, I'm a, I'm a kind of a, I'm a spokesman for our brands, of course. We have quite a few brands. Yeah, I know that. Uh, an amazing portfolio. It is an amazing portfolio. Uh, and that's probably well, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm still around, <laughs> <laughs> because I love the products. Uh, we have literally 30, 31 distilleries, single malt distilleries, just mainly in Scotland. And, and uh, whiskey has been my, kind of my, my pillar, my strongest pillar ever since I, I started in, in, in the business 34, 35 years ago as a BA, brand ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, but also what I'm trying to do is to convince people that whiskey is, it's not dangerous. So what I'm trying to do is, some kind of converting those people. I bring them into a masterclass. I tell them what whiskey really is about. And it's about flavors. It's about storytelling. It's about a way of living, a lifestyle, so to speak. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, it'll take some time, but you will get there. But I think the most important thing is to make people, you know, understand what, what whiskey is about five more than 500 years ago we started distilling scotch as we say yeah. in scotland and um, look where we are today it's booming literally it's booming you said 35 distilleries uh, under the uh, diageo yes i think we're up to i think i know <laughs> it's 30 31 there are a couple of distilleries uh, will be reopened. Brora Distillery just opened uh, a year ago, roughly a year ago. Port Ellen, one of the most well-known distilleries. A cult and, distillery. And, uh, right, it Can is. Can you name some, uh, some of the other? Yeah, of well, the there are so many. I mean, Mortlake, uh, uh, the Hidden Gem from, from, from Dufton. We have, of course, the Space Side Distilleries with Glen Dallan, with Dufftown. We have Glen Ord up, up, uh, up in the north. Uh, Cardu has been around for many, many years. There are on the west coast, Lagavulin, Cooley, La Oban, Talisker and some other guys. Wow. There are so many distilleries. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm trying to, to you know, catch up with what's happening in all the distilleries every day. It's a tough work. I believe that. I <laughs> so believe I need to that. focus on, 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 on a fewer uh, uh, distilleries. Yeah. Of course, that makes sense. Yeah. We are here tonight at uh, Villa Canada in Copenhagen and having a whiskey occasion, tasting some nice whiskey and having some uh, nice uh, finger foods and just, uh, just having a nice time. But one of the whiskies we are going to taste tonight is actually here with us on the table. Right. Can you uh, tell us something about oh, that definitely, bottle? Yeah, definitely. Well, this is one of my babies, um, uh, so to speak. Tyler's Gerb has been around ever since 1830. It's one of the oldest distillers we, we, still, we still run. This is a 25 year old. This is a highly sought after talisker. And I think every whiskey aficionado, every whiskey connoisseur, when they see a talisker 25, they go bananas, they buy it. <laughs> because the liquid um, being you know, rested in, in refill American hogshead for 25 years, being bottled, and here it is, 
uh, you want to try it? I really would. <laughs> you really would. Go, let's go ahead then. Uh, it it is something stunning. So if you're into whiskey, mm -hmm. um, I would say Talisker 25 is one of the most personal whiskey. When I say personal, I mean it's got so many flavors, so many nuances that it'll take us a day or two to, you know, to, to dig down uh, to, to, you know, to, to the essence of, of whiskey and Talisker. But what I normally do is just to raise your glass. Look at the, look at the color. It's a beautiful color. It is beautiful, the kind of reddish uh, tone to it. And then, oh, wow, the flavor, the smell is absolutely delicious. It's 45.8 ABV as alcohol by volume, which is a bit strong, mm -hmm. but you don't get it, really. Tim, let's... Uh, let's have a sip. Let's have a sip. Looking forward to yeah. this. Slant your bar. Cheers. Wow. Hmm. This is stunning. And one thing I'm very, I'm very careful about is the way we drink it. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you meet people in a pub or in a restaurant or even back home, you know, your boy, your boy band or whatever, <laughs> yeah. uh, most of us in our generation they tend to shoot it, mm -hmm. which is completely wrong. I mean, it has taken us literally 200 years to produce that from the very start. This is 25 years in casks, sorry, in casks. Now, it, one, two, maybe three minutes later, you can still get it. So I'm, I'm always trying to, to make people aware of all the flavors because there are 180, 190 different flavors in that glass wow. and to be able to enjoy all those it needs time you need to close your eyes focus on the liquid let it stay in your mouth for I would say 25 30 seconds let it come down slowly 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 then take a deep breath and now you understand what whiskey in this case, Talisk is about sweetness, sourness, acidity, bitterness, fatness, bodiness, love. This is what whiskey really is about. Not, you know, the shooter and then straight to the, to the, uh, to the football game or wherever you're going. <laughs> so it's, it's culture uh, and we need to understand that. And that's one of the points I do have with, with my you know, students or whatever. Take your time. You should never drink a whiskey in a rush. You need at least 35, 40 minutes with your buddy, with your best friends, with your, with your partner, whoever, just to have a sit down, indulge it, nose it, taste it, discuss it, and then come back to it. But tonight, I'm lucky enough to uh, taste that again uh, later tonight. You are as well. Uh, but we will uh, taste some different whiskies together with some snacks and some finger yeah. foods. Yeah. Um, some people are having uh, whiskey dinners occasionally. But uh, like, you know, at Rare Wine, we love everything wine. And some of the, the great things about wine is pairing it with food. Yeah. Can we do that with whiskies as well? Absolutely. And, uh, and, and how yes. to start doing so. Right. So. Uh, um, I love wine. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, when I do dinners, and I do them fairly often, I normally go with whiskey and, and let's say a five meal course. But I don't serve whiskey straight up. I, I do cocktails. Mm. So I have cocktail pairing dinners. 
meaning I if just give you any, uh, give you a small kind of brief. I would pick five different whiskies. I will make five different cocktails. One a bit sour, one a bit sweet, one a bit one with with acidity, one with with uh, with some some maybe saltiness, some 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 power, some peatiness. And I will mix it with with uh, lemon juice, different cordials, different bitters, etc., etc. When you do a cocktail pairing whiskey dinner, you will interest even the ladies, because if I do master classes or I do a, a whiskey dinner, I will have 25 boys, which is fair enough. But if the invitation says whiskey cocktail, tapas dinner, or something like that, half of them will be ladies. And we need them at the table to get you know, more, I would say, better, not better maybe, but, but more interesting conversations. Not everything about a football. A bit of dynamic. A bit more dynamic, yeah. absolutely. So cocktails, that's brilliant. And you can, you can you can create so many different flavors when it comes to cocktails. Wine, brilliant, I like it, but you have your wine, you know where it, where, uh, how it works and, and, and how it goes with, with the food. But with the cocktails, you can squeeze around and tweak around and you can have fantastic cocktails to a superb dinner. What is your go-to whiskey cocktail for dinner then? Can you, uh, uh, <laughs> can you tell us here? Do you have a, a, an well, easy go-to recipe for that? Yes, I have a few, but I would say my go-to would be uh, a Talisker Sour. Talisker Sour? It's a whiskey sour, mm. but I replace the bourbon or, or, or the rye and, and pour Talisker. Not the 25, it's a bit too expensive, <laughs> but I'll do it with uh, Talisker 10. Mm. A proper whiskey sour, or as I say, a Talisker sour. Brilliant. It gets a bit more you know, body to it, a bit more alcohol, and then you have the sugar and you have the, 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 the lemon. Brilliant. That is one of my favorites. What is your go-to dram at the moment? Your go-to whiskey? Yeah, my go-to whiskey would be more like 16-year-old Flora and Fauna. Now discontinued, uh, but you can find it in auction houses and, and on the net. But that's my go-to whiskey. Did you start up at home? Uh, next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> what is the best whiskey you have uh, tasted that comes to your mind right now? Right now, wow, it's been uh, over my 34, 35 years in the business. Um, there are quite a few, but I was lucky enough when I was working with a different, uh, another country, another company, uh, and tried um, a whiskey that was distilled the last year in the Second World War and bottled uh, 52 years later. That is um, once in a lifetime experience because it's not only about the whiskey it's about history storytelling so when I had it when I drank it I was literally thinking about the Second World War when it was distilled and bottled 52 years later oh, wow. that's a wow experience Wow, that, yeah a holistic experience for, for yeah, that whiskey indeed <laughs> What is the most expensive whiskey you have uh, ever tasted? Wow. And uh, do you know uh, approximate the retail price? Of yeah, well, uh, whiskeys that uh, has a retail, recommended retail price, uh, more than 100,000 uh, Danish kroner, uh, many times. Um, lucky enough to be part of a, of a fantastic business. So whenever I'm in, in Scotland, and, and it happens quite often, um, sometimes you, you, you run into my friends mm -hmm. in the whiskey community and they might say, Michael, would you like to try something very different? That could be something, you know, very, very uh, expensive or very limited. And sometimes for me, money is not the most important thing. It's, again, the moment you're sharing with your partner, with your friend, 
um, somewhere in, in the world where it, it, it is 100% uh, I mean, completely, completely right. You're sitting down in a nice venue like this, having a wee sip, everything is okay. Your life is on top. But again, I mean, you can't really match value of the whiskey and the taste. It doesn't go hand in hand because there are limited bottles. There are five bottles of that one, 10 of this one. And they, as you know, they, 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 they increase. Right. Yeah, they, sky, they go through the roof, yeah. I want to talk a little about uh, collecting uh, yep. whiskey. Because it's uh, no news that collectors have seen uh, the value of their collections mm. rise tremendously yeah, over the, yeah. the past years. In fact, uh, over the past 10 years, the, mm. the price on fine uh, whiskey has increased uh, more than uh, 420%, beating yeah. uh, almost uh, every other uh, yeah. investment uh, yeah. collecting asset. Can you uh, shed some light on uh, this development and mm. how this can be? Yeah. Uh, very interesting question. I, I think, um, again, back to what I said, limited editions. Um, and let me go back to 1995-96 when it all started. Uh, we had um, an ocean of whiskey at the time. An ocean, literally an ocean, with every distillery kind of gearing up and we had you know, our warehouses filled with whiskey. And then the whiskey boom started in many countries around the globe, especially up here in the Nordics. But then UK came around, Germany, Benelux, et cetera, et cetera. So after a few years, some of the older whiskies were kind of diminishing. And also, as you understand, the prices, they went up and they increased. This is 30 years ago. Now, we still have, not problems, but we still have very few distilleries with with big, big stocks of old whiskey. And when we launch whiskey, we know there are guys out there in many emerging markets, especially, but also in, in the mature markets like UK, the Nordic markets, uh, Switzerland, um, France. And these guys are willing to pay more than they could afford, I would say 10, 15 years ago. or I'll change it, they are willing to spend, they are prioritizing the whiskey spends more than buying a new car or buying a new you know, summer house or a boat or whatever, because we are talking a lot of money for some of those SKUs, as, as you said, 400% up. I mean, we beat gold, we beat uh, uh, art, we beat more or less everything. And it's, it looks like it's gonna continue because some of the, the distillers, the, the, the producing companies, they, they don't have enough of old liquid. We will get there because now we are distilling 24 seven. Every, I think it's 142 or 144 whiskey distillers just in Scotland. And they're all distilling 24 seven. So if we are sitting here, Tim, in let's say in 20, 25 years, there will be more whiskey then than we can find now on the market. So it will still increase. And as, as we speak, you know, guys from China, 1.4 billion people, India, which is the biggest company now, 1.5 billion uh, people. We have US coming on, we have South America, countries like Brazil, 300 million people, Argentina, I now understand business, the whiskey business, a bit more than five, six years ago. Russian market, um, and again, Southeast Asia with Hong Kong, Singapore, and all those countries, Japan. Wow, it's a big, big interest. So we are lucky to get allocations uh, sometimes when we are looking for older, uh, older whiskies like 25-year-old like Talis Group or similar. So your bet is that um, until the distilleries get there and have been producing enough and have been storing enough, maybe uh, un until 25, 30 years, yeah. the development it's take, will it's uh, take time. The yeah. development will continue. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think so, definitely. Wow. And as as I said, I mean, I'm I'm teaching, 
and bringing in the rookies, mm -hmm. people 25, 30, 35 years of, of age, and they know that whiskey is the right thing to drink. It's social, it's got culture, people love Scotland. Scotland is one of the key countries where you know travel agencies are sending their customers to. Uh, so I understand, I mean, I look at my, my own son, he's 27 years of age, I mean, he knows more than I do. When I was 27, I was drinking beer and, and shooters. But the youngsters today, they are drinking um, branded stuff, they know the, the, the brand, they know why they're drinking it, they maybe they've been there two or three times to that distillery, so people are more out there. We have Google, of course, we can read about everything, people are well aware of, of, of their you know, consumption uh, and their behaviours are different from, from when we you know, grew up many years ago, or not many years ago, but some time ago. <laughs> <laughs> The modern whiskey drinker versus the old-fashioned drink, yeah. uh, whiskey drinker. Can you shed some light on uh, these <coughs> type of uh, stereotypes and how maybe the, the whiskey business is developing together with the, yeah. the modern whiskey drinkers? That's another very good question and something I you know, run into more or less every day. The people who I trained, let's say 25, 30, 35 years ago, instantly understood single malt scotch whiskies from the west coast. So Isla whiskey, we're talking Lagavulin, Kulila, Lafroig, Ardbeg, Brookladi and these guys, Oban, Talisker. Because there's something about salty, peaty, tarry, uh, quite medicinal whiskies. And as being a, a Nordic person living up here in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, we are quite used to that climate. It's tough climate. We are also used to be drinking hard liquor like Aquavit, Schnapps, um, and we shoot it like the, you know, the Russians, the Poles, the Nordic. We do that. It's, you know, kind of generation after generation has been drinking uh, uh, liquid like that. It's changing now. The old generation, I would say my generation, are still very much onto the, the whiskies from the West Coast, but they are understanding that there are other parts of Scotland who produce very good whisky. So from the mainland, from the lowland, from the highland. But they regretted for years to say, well, it's not my cup of tea. I stick with my Isla malt whisky because that's my cup of, that's my cup of tea. That's what I that's what I know. They I, I don't think they knew what they were missing. When people are open and honest with me, and they might come back and say, well, Michael, I was wrong. I mean, you, you told me 15 years ago that a Mortlach or a Cragamore or a Cardew is so diverse. There are so many more flavors in a, a Speyside whiskey. So why didn't I listen better to you? <laughs> now I understand what you, what, you, what you said. So the young generation who are more open-minded, they read more, they travel more, I, I reach them more easily than I did 15, 20 years ago with the, with the older generation. So I think the young guys today, 25, 30, 35, they are very much into more, I would say, st not streamlined, it's the wrong word, but more mouth coating, um, I would say complex whiskey, fruity whiskey, uh, chocolate, uh, and other aromas, flavors that will come through instead of the salty, maritime, beaty, tough whiskies. Um, I mean, you can have both, but the younger generation is more into the more diverse whisky, which, which is for me very natural, but that's the trend I see right now. Wow. Michael, thank you so much for, for the stories, and uh, let's have a toast. Let's have a toast. Why not?
Cheers, Sven Schwab. Thank you very much. Thank you.